morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a privilege to be here on the, the 10th uh, Construction Innovation Forum. Uh, it's a great event put on by Sir Mitch Shannon and the AMCA, and it is a privilege to be up here this morning. Um, there's been some great speakers over the last couple of days, and um, of note yesterday, Rod mentioned a term that I'm a big fan of, which is full BIM. Um, full BIM's a funny term in our industry. Uh, as MET contractors, I'll sit across the table from head contractors and they'll say, so Matt, are you implementing full BIM on this process, on this project? And my response is, yeah, I guess so. And I'll ask them, what is full BIM? And they usually give me a blank stare and they have no idea. They don't know how to respond. So is full BIM just documenting in Revit because we have to? Is it something we have to do to fulfill our contractual liabilities? <coughs> full BIM's only for large projects. Is it something we're only doing on billion dollar projects and there's layers and layers of teams? That gets to the expensive point of things. Utilising full BIM is expensive. Do we need to go down that path? Or is it really just for architects and consultants? Is it something that, as a contractor, why do I have to worry about utilising technology and 3D at all? What benefit is it to me? And is it about the data? Is it about implementing an LOD standard of three, four, five hundred? What benefit is that to the client? This morning, I'd just like to discuss some of the experiences we've had as mechanical contractors throughout the industry implementing technology, BIM, and different processes and workflows, and how that can benefit both us as a business, our projects, and our clients. And you might have seen the photo that was up there before. Um, I might look a little bit different to that now. If you hadn't met me two months ago, this was me here. Why the beard, you might ask. Um, I did it for 12 months. Lisa say my wife's very happy now, I don't have it anymore. And Sumit did say to me this morning, thank God you got rid of that bloody beard. <laughs> my background is mechanical engineering. Um, I worked at General Motors Holden for about three or four years in the electrical engineering department, product design and validation. Got to do some pretty cool stuff, some software development, some programming, drive cars around tracks at 250Ks plus an hour, and now I design air conditioning. <laughs> but it's good fun. So I work at PJM Engineering. I'd be remiss if I didn't show a photo of a Melbourne contractor on an RDO at a golf day. So this is us at a golf day. We've been around for 38 years, family-owned business installing commercial HVAC across all different facilities within Melbourne. Um, approximately 50% of our work is new builds, so hospitals and laboratories, universities, some recent projects here with some PC2 labs and operating theatres and isolation rooms, so mechanically quite technical, um, and utilising technology on these projects is, is really of benefit to us. Some other projects, including some industrial work and some residential uh, hotels, student accommodation, and the like. The other 50% of our work is roughly refurbishments and installation of existing buildings. So some recent examples, WeWorks, two new facilities in Melbourne, Collins Street and Spencer Street, 10 floors and seven, seven floors respectively, um, and some heritage refurbishment buildings, which we'll get to a little bit later on. So that's roughly the work that we do at the moment. Now, our industry is really difficult, it's multi-layered, it's multifaceted, and clearly today there's many different players in the game, and there's many different stages within the construction life cycle. So we work through the planning, the design phase, I'm not going to go through all of these, the construct phase, and obviously the operation phase, and you can see just the tip of the iceberg, some steps that are involved within our industry. It can get pretty complex. And then we add layers on top of that, the teams and the people involved and it starts to get really interesting with personalities and different software and the way in which we work together. Then we start to load on, as I said, all of the software. And again, tip of the iceberg, just a handful of programs that you all might be familiar with that make our lives sometimes easier, sometimes harder, depend on who you're working with and what sort of project you're working on. So some challenges that I see in our industry. In Australia, current population of around 25 million. By 2030, it's going to be 30 million. An increase of 5 million people, obviously, 
At the moment, our construction industry is valued at around $150 billion. These people are going to need somewhere to live, somewhere to work. So we need to have a look at how we're doing things and how can we create buildings more efficiently. How can we do that to save us as a business owner as well as our clients and the end user, the people who are moving into these facilities, so that the buildings are more efficient and we can roll on to the next project. Similarly, project timing is often a difficult one. When I started at General Motors Holden, I was an undergraduate. I don't think they knew what I should have done on my first day, so I got thrown an Excel spreadsheet. It was the General Motors acronyms. It was 12,000 acronyms in that spreadsheet. I didn't read any of it, waste of time. But one of my favourite acronyms within our industry, and Dave mentioned it a little bit before, was um, ECI and early contractor involvement. And getting involved early, particularly for the specialist contractors who understand the buildability and the mechanics of such work, whether it be electrical, plumbing, mechanical and structural. Um, and then collaboration, so we can avoid situations like this. Very schematic, but collaboration is really key to all of these things becoming more efficient and being able to actually develop working projects as a team rather than individual silos. So the ways in which we use some technology, some very simple ones up front, digital review. When we win a project, we have a look at how we're going to implement that project, where are our sticking points and what are our, what are our issues potentially going to be. A recent project at a university with three 700 kilowatt reverse cycle heat pumps on the roof, how we're going to install these if they're going to be coming late on the project. These units are installed on the roof and we can have a quick look. This is a very simple digitization of the installation of these units through the steel members to understand that they're going to fit through the steel that's already installed so that we're not taking up the general contractor's time on the tower crane that typically has to come down probably the next day. Being mechanical, our plant is on the roof. It's typically the last thing before the tower crane comes down. It's pretty critical for the general contractor. I've been in the industry for about five years now and I began as a project manager, project engineer, wearing a few different hats, as most of us all would in this room. One of the projects that I started working on in about 2016, 2017 was Dulux new paint manufacturing facility here in Melbourne. They're currently, ma they're currently manufacturing over a million litres of paint per week. So it's a pretty prestigious factory, biggest in Australia and New Zealand. <coughs> we received the contract and little to my knowledge, it was LED 500. I didn't even know what LED was. I had to Google it and I found out I could be up for a bit of cost as a project manager, which worried me. But that was okay. So we documented the project and we got to a stage where we progressed from our model so we do a pretty detailed installation as part of an integrated fit out with the client. The LED perspective of the project was never actually followed through and we handed over to the client at the end of the day, PDFs, because that's all they asked for. The knowledge wasn't there in the industry. I certainly didn't know what LED was at all and the client didn't know what they were asking for. They were more than happy with PDFs and some hard copy O&Ms. I think, I like to think, we've come a long way from there <laughs> since then. Again, some early stage benefits of reviewing our installation. So some large flue stacks on a roof. This is again out of Dulux. Understanding and reviewing with our foreman how we're going to install these, what we need to build beforehand to actually get these in safely, understanding our wind loadings and any structural implications and how we're going to, how we're going to crane these up in a timely manner. You can see there, installed with these over a couple of hours in my morning. Again, on the factory being a large footprint, obviously, um, it was about 150 metres by 60 metres wide, so quite sizeable. 15, 200 kilo evaporative units on the roof, nothing major, but to get a crane to actually reach to those, those areas, we can see there we've got a 65 metre reach at our largest extremity. So I had to do a cost benefit analysis of a crane lifting these units on. So a 220 tonne crane for a couple of days it was only going to be for a couple of hours of lifting. The biggest portion of my cost was going to be set down and set up of the 220 tonne crane. In my mind, a waste of time. So we looked at other alternatives. A simple screen share with a coordinated Navisworks model 
with another company to have a look at how we're going to install these and then a single site review to understand our set down and lay down areas allowed us to review the best methodology to install these items on the roof on a Sunday morning. Each unit took five minutes to install after our safety briefing and we were out of there in 90 minutes. And the best part about this, it cost me one third of my crane costs. So Phil was happy about that, obviously. <laughs> Another install methodology of a complex project. An existing theatre with new trusses installed. And we can see here in the green and the purple, the trusses that are already installed. Now these were installed pretty much the week we got a contract. So we had, didn't really have any say about how we we're going to do this. There was no chance to prefabricate any of this duct within the trusses. There was no chance to coordinate that work. We were given what we were given. So our duct work in the grey here had to be documented so that we could physically install it within the truss space, but it also had to be manufacturable as well. So a few constraints and obviously timing. The roof was about to go on. So we reviewed it obviously coordinating with our site manager. Each, each piece was 200 kilos of ductwork and the methodology of how we're going to install each piece. Some fairly detailed manufacturing drawings so that we could understand how they were going to hang them and how we're going to make sure they fit within the building and within each truss space. And then slotting them into place. You can see here in the space there, reviewing on site. That's some of the site risks that we review, just using some technology, really basic things that everyone can implement. All you need is a Neversworx free viewer. There's nothing wrong with using that. But what about our digital risk? Where's our risk on a project that we might get let quite quickly and we haven't reviewed the digital risk? Is it a mess? A lot of projects now, when we get let the project, we'll sit with a general contractor and they might say, Matt, can you give me an honest evaluation of the consultant's model? So sure, I'll have a quick look. Can you do a clash detection on the consultant's model and give us some information on how well they've coordinated it? So well, it's not really worth doing because it's not going to be accurate. The detail that, in, that is within the consultant's model is not going to be accurate. They're not going to have had the soffit insulation model. They're not going to have the insulation on all of the plumbing equipment as well as the piping and duct work. So if I do the clash detection, it's going to give me false data. So the best way to go about it is to actually interrogate the actual data so that we can provide constructive feedback. And in my personal opinion, Dave touched on it before, the models that we're receiving from consulting firms, sorry to any consultants in the room, are really a waste of time. We throw them in the bin and we start again. So schematic design is key as part of that collaboration process. What are our BIM execution responsibilities? So here in Australia, the mechanical contractors are always novated effectively as the lead services contractor or the coordinator. So what we have to do in that regard could be anything. It could be just making sure everyone goes into the right spots within, within the building and understanding what we're up against. So there's a couple of tasks that are involved typically and sometimes they can be pretty labour intensive um, and overhead intensive that we haven't allowed for for a project too. So understanding within our head contract what we're going to have to do for a project. If we've got to execute and create a BIM execution plan, it's not something that's going to be a 200 page document. We're going to keep it nice and short and we're going to keep that live and living and engage the other project members. We're not going to sit down and get bogged down in the minor detail because at the end of the day, we're trying to deliver a project efficiently with the other contractors that are on board. And what are our LOD responsibilities? I mentioned before, LED 500, I had no idea what it was two years ago. Um, a very basic example of a component here. But how far are we going to have to go in our project and what data is going to have to be output to the client? What's the cost going to be to us? Do we need to allow for that in tender? Does the client actually need all of this data? Is it relevant or do we need to work with them to actually dictate? You might not need all of the data around one piece of equipment <laughs> You're only after the data that's relevant for operation in terms of run hours on a pump um, and those sorts of things. 
So it's important to understand what you're up against in terms of level of development as well. So within our office, we've got an internal design team um, and we utilise a range of different tools for design and coordination. Um, of note and of recent BIM 360 as a collaboration tool, which has been talked about the last couple of days. It has its nuances, but it's a great tool, um, particularly when you're utilising teams in other offices, other states um, and other companies. One of the big things that I've learnt from the automotive industry is just to be able to build in the understanding of what's required on site. So DFMA, which you may or may not be familiar with, design for manufacture and assembly, is really about designing a component that is buildable. There's no point in me designing a piece of ductwork that's five metres long that I can't carry into a building because one, you can't make it, and two, it's not movable. So we need to make sure that we're, our design standards allow for manufacture as well as assembly on site. There's no point, again, sizing a piece of pipework that doesn't fit within a lift in a building that you have to get to the 20th floor. And these are really simple things to think about as a designer, but sometimes they get forgotten. Bill of materials. So as an example, a simple cut sheet bill of materials with a standard spiral length, 16 pieces of spiral, all detailed, and this can all be scheduled out and automated rather than sitting there doing a schedule, taking our measurements and sent straight to the duck shop. <coughs> Part of our process, as typical, would be, as most people, a coordination and a level of coordination utilising Navis works. When we first started doing coordination meetings, they were long, laborious. They felt like a little bit of a waste of time. You get a bit of RSI on your wrist from moving around the screen for three hours and talking about clashes. In, an, in the initial stages, the coordination phase the day prior, it would take me probably a couple of hours, three to four hours, to put together a model, federate it, run the clashes, run the reports, and it was getting boring, really, really boring. So looking at ways to automate that by creating yourself search sets, predefined viewpoints, predefined clash tests, tolerances, and grouping clashes in certain ways that the BIM execution plan allows for, brings that process down to under half an hour. It's almost automated, and it's just a human sense check to make sure the data is accurate. Some other tools that we use as part of coordination and also some site, which we'll get to later on, is um, Revisto, the guys are out the front. A great little tool and a great add-on to the Autodesk project, uh, the Autodesk products. So we can take any project and punch it straight into Revisto and track that project's metrics. We can track the clashes on that project, whether it be from the office or in the field. It works both ways. And Revisto is a great viewing platform for site. So I'll get to site a little bit later on. But from site, what we can do is we can mark up our models and push these data, this data straight back to our straight back to the office, straight back to the project manager and the design team. So in this example, a site foreman can mark up and pop a text box and say, well, this damp has been made wrong. I need you to order a new one ASAP. Press send, and that's it. It's an automated email sent to whoever's on the distribution list. And you don't have to sit there and take a photo, put it into your email, find the right email, send it off, and then you've forgotten to send it to the right person, whatever it might be. This is all predefined and automated, all you're doing is just finding your issues on site. It's really helped us push things together on site. Something that we've embraced over the last uh, 18 months as well, which Dave was really impressive about what he was talking about before, is prefabrication. <coughs> we all know the benefits of prefabrication. We all know it's safer. We all know that it can be cheaper, more accurate, and we can do our QA off site. In this example, uh, we recently prefabricated two risers for a hospital here in Melbourne, um, this being the larger. Some detailed sheets, obviously, for manufacture, and this was all fabricated off-site. There's three eight-metre modules. We can break our modules up and give all the detail to the guys on site, who are, the guys in the factory who are building these modules. There's a little bit of a video of the install of this riser here that I'll show you. We lifted this in over two days. You'll note the sunny day and the cloudy day, very typical Melbourne. They were one after each other. Due to the high winds and weather, we had to hold off on one day. 
Now the benefit of utilizing 3D for this process is that we can review this with the entire team in our coordination meeting. We can design our steel frame around the actual data that we've utilized from Revit. And we can understand things are gonna be installed correctly, nice and neatly. The structural engineering was also a big part of this, obviously, with all of the weight going through. And it is nice and neat when things line up accurately and you can move on. It's a lot quicker, obviously, than building it, building it on site. So this is not Elon Musk's opinion of the construction industry, although it might be if he popped onto some of the sites in Melbourne. Um, about two months ago, Elon Musk was quoted with saying that LiDAR is a fool's errand. And that was in respect to autonomous vehicles, obviously. So Tesla are the only company who are not utilizing LiDAR. They've dismissed it and said they'd rather go with photogrammetry. There's a whole different raft of reasons why you would want to do that. Everyone else is using LiDAR. I disagree with this because LiDAR is brilliant for our industry. The accuracy is fantastic, it's enough. We're not dealing with microns, we're dealing with millimetres in our industry. It's a little bit rough and ready on occasion. Um, so about two years ago we acquired uh, our BLK360 as well. The so CR Kennedy's um, a good partner of ours, also out the front. Um, like Dave was saying earlier before the break, that it's, ch it's changed our company. Our designers don't want to work without a scan. You can imagine going to site and measuring all facets of an existing site. Like I said, 50% of our work is refurbishments. Existing, measuring your existing beams and pipe work, get back to the office and only to find that you've missed two or three dimensions. It'll ruin your day. By doing this and utilizing our BLK, we can define everything, and if we've missed anything, we can pick it up straight away. So there's a little bit of learning to do and some detailed office process, and everyone in our office in the design department now can confidently go out and scan by themselves. Um, as an example of going out and scanning projects, we leave ourselves a little bit of a breadcrumb to understand how we've built it, and whilst the scan is scanning, I encourage the guys to understand what else is on site? Are we reusing some existing pipe work or is there an existing penetration that we need to identify? Because you set the scanner up, leave it for five minutes, there's no point standing there twiddling your thumbs. You'd rather still be working and understanding what the site is about. The office process, nice and easy. The registration, as Dave said, if something happens, all you need to do is register manually on site or back in the office and we align nice and easily, nice and straight away and we can move on. Something that we've developed and started to utilize a little bit more in the last couple of months is scan to BIM. You might have heard the term. So scanning a project is fantastic. You get your point cloud and you can link that within your Revit file. But sometimes it's a little bit granular. You might have missed the edges of the beams. You might not be able to get to a pipe. So actually modeling in those existing services effectively over what you've scanned. So in this example, we've got a floor plate you can see here, we've gone through, we've done about 10 or 12 scans throughout the building. Quite a small floor plate, existing structure. And you'll see here, we move over to it. Now the BLK360 will give you a 360 degree photo that you can play with at each of those spheres there of the scans. And you can measure straight off the 360 degree photo. So you're able to see what the site was like on that given day. And then we can move to our point cloud and this can obviously be linked within our authoring tool, which is fantastic. Now th in this example, it was brilliant because it was a clear site, existing beams, nothing else to deal with, nice and easy. The head contractor asked us to scan a little bit of an area in here for uh, the steel contractor to put their stairwell in. So no problems, we're here anyway, we'll do the scans. <laughs> Being nice and uh, being the nice person that I am, I packaged it all up, put it all on the cloud because it was large data, sent them the link and said, here you go, any trouble, let me know. <coughs> Next day I got an email back, please send PDFs. <laughs> That's part of the education of the industry. I didn't write back straight away because I was a bit annoyed, but 
but I wrote back the next day and told them they should down, try and download Recap and have a play, and if they really want, I'll show them how to do it. But it didn't get that far. Similarly, the questions I often get asked are, can the scanner see through walls? But again, we're educating the industry. So scan to BIM. Effectively, this has been done by, um, by Verus. Verus are a fantastic geospatial company, um, surveying company. Look them up if you don't know about them. They completed this for the client six months prior to us scanning the site. Obviously, we didn't know about it, so we went and did the work again. Thanks for telling us, head contractor. Anyway, it was brilliant because this is actually within Revit with solid objects. We can snap and we can check the validity, validity of all of the beams, all of the dimensions, and we know they're accurate, and we can link that Revit file rather than the point cloud within our model. So we've started to do this with projects where we do refurbishments, We'll do a scan, and then we'll start to model in our own beams. It might be an existing large pipe, a large siphonic pipe, or a sewer that's not going to be shifted, just so we're aware what's going to be there, and it's a solid object for everyone to see, rather than a point cloud. So an example of where scanning's benefited us over the last 18 months, um, I was running this project as a project manager. Quite a difficult project. This is obviously not recent days. So a theatre out at Monash University was built around 1952. This is the original construction. Now they wanted to keep the original shape of the theatre, just knocking down some of the brickwork, but keeping the existing slab and turning that theatre into what it is now, which is effectively the same shape, just nice and new. So for those who are unaware about how mechanical systems work in the theatre, pretty simple. We supply conditioned air from above, heating and cooling for the audience, and then in this case, it's brought back to the plant room from below uh, in what we call the return air. So each of those return airs had to come through under the seating where you'd all be sitting now. They were all coming back through an approximate 300 by 100 existing hole in the existing slab. There's 50 of these in the existing slab. Painstaking to go through and measure them all off a datum. Difficult, time consuming, boring. So. The first project that we ever scanned as a company was this one. And you can see it's still here. We scanned these whilst the bulldozers were in there. Typical sort of scanning when we're doing, whilst the builder's demo demolishing everything. And you can see here just an example. That's just a light shading of one of the existing penetrations. One day spent scanning. If we were to site measure this, it would have been a minimum of five days and probably pretty frustrating, like I said. From there, we can effectively produce a penetration drawing of the existing building based on that scan data. And now we can start to complete our ductwork design based on that. So as I said, return air under the seating coming through from below, some concepts that we're working towards to get, those, get the return air back under the seating. And a pretty detailed model that we produced. Again, our detailed shop drawings for manufacture, which is quite detailed following the rake of the existing slab, as you can see there in that section and connecting up to those existing openings. An example of what the concrete looked like post-installation, which was nice and neat. So you can imagine in a theatre, there's some pretty stringent acoustic requirements. Now, in this specific example, this is the second theatre in the country to be built with active acoustics. Think noise-cancelling headphones. 28 microphones hanging from the ceiling, to pick up any background noise, cancel it out so the performer could do their thing. And what's the main source of noise within a theatre? Unfortunately, it's us. Mechanical systems, background noise events, air moving around. So in this scenario, you'll remember that the return air was coming from above and coming through the grills under the seating. Late one night, about 9 or 10 o'clock, we're doing our acoustic tests, walking around. The acoustician's got his um, acoustic meter. Far too loud. We're aiming for an NR of 20 to 25, which, if you're not aware, is quite low. We're reading 30 to 35. Straight away, it's my fault. What are we going to do? So the acoustician pointed out and thought it was the supplier from above that had been throttled back too much and we were re regenerating noise throughout the duct. I disagreed, got on my hands and knees and said, I think we've got our problem under the seat. We did some testing by turning systems on and off, 
and identified that it was the grills underneath the seat because of the pitch on the blades creating turbulence within the box. So what was our solution? Turn around the other way. Pretty simple. Straight away we took our readings, the airflow was then laminar rather than turbulent to an extent and we were able to achieve our NR. And the lesson learned from this project was that scanning is invaluable um, and acoustics are still a dark art. <laughs> Another example of where we've utilised uh, scanning, really to our benefit, was a recent hospital project, 200 mil condenser water pipe running across a car park. Seems nice and simple, pretty easy on the plan view. 200 mil pipe work soon grows to 219 mil steel pipe work. Then if it needs to be insulated, in this case it didn't, which was great, condensed water pipe work. And then we look at our Victolic couplings. Our restrictions through a car park might have been 2100, in this case 2200 because of DDA compliance. So we're really up against it, particularly with the given infrastructure that was there. There was no structural model of this area because it was existing and it was pretty heavily service service orientated because obviously being a hospital, so pneumatic tube, fire pipe work, cable tray, medical gas and the like. So straight away, scanning in this area was a no-brainer. Rather than spending two or three meetings on site with all of the other services contractors to understand where they wanted to go, we effectively drew all of their services for them and told them where to go because it was a lot easier. And not, not literally, but we, we told them where to put it in. A quick little video of that. <coughs> I don't know if it needs the motivational music, it's not that inspiring, but our, uh, our tech guy thought it was good, so he added it. And this is something that we run through with the client before we go to manufacture, so you can see how installed in orange, um, existing in blue, that was the existing intent. And this is something we can get signed off by the client and all the other services just by sending this straight through to them, rather than going on site, walking through it for the fifth time to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And there's us installed at the end of the day, compliant working, and it fits. So site efficiencies. Our biggest cost in Australia is labour, which is great for our economy, but as a business, we need to be conscious of it. We need to understand how can we get the best out of our plumbers, your electricians, whoever it is on your site, so that we can move on to the next project. So this year we've acquired a set out tool, nothing new to the industry really, new to us, which is great. We really need, the, the driver behind this was for our plumbers to be doing plumbing work, not to be setting out, not getting a string line and setting out, marking out on site, because they need to be doing what they're good at. So a quick return on investment calculation, having a look at a standard floor plate, round numbers, 1,000 square metres. Mechanically, we might have about 1,000 points to set out, whether it might be hangers, penetrations, bits of equipment and whatnot. If we round that down at about 10% that physically need to be set out off a grid, for whatever reason, the rest might be linear, runs of pipe and duct work, then we've got about five minutes per set out over 100 points. It's just under a day's work, eight hours for a normal person, right? Seems like a waste of time to have one of our plumbers go around and set out for an entire day on a floor. Multiply that by 20 floors, you spend a lot of time just drawing dots on the floor. So our process, our process and our calculation against that time spent in the office, Maximum one hour, we've gone to site and tested it and validated. Two to three hours maximum on site, we've halved our set out time immediately. And we've only started doing this in the last three months. So we know that our payback is going to be this, this year, this financial year. Another, another aspect of this um, site efficiency has also created a new role within our company. So as part of the scanning and the site set out, we've created a construction technical lead role which is a plumber who is really interested in technology, which is brilliant. And they can speak both languages. We've now got plumbers utilising Revit in the office, whether it might be doing points or just linking point clouds and understanding 
the difficulties that we have in the office, potentially with design or software, but they also understand the site and they can talk the same language as the plumbers and convey what we're actually trying to, trying to do. So our office process was nice and, nice and simple. Um, we're still working, through the, still working through bits and pieces of how we export that data. Now, this is a new product from Leica. Uh, they've only just entered the market, effectively the construction market with this product, which is brilliant. And again, getting support from CR Kennedy's to do this work has really been helpful. Um, they're, they're the experts in terms of surveying and uh, they can give any input that need be. So our site process, once we've organised our office process and we've utilised the Autodesk point layout tool, our site process is very, very simple. As I said, a couple of hours to set out a floor and we can do multiple floors in a day and just move on. So a single example, about an 80 metre pipe run of chilled and heating water pipe at a current project we're working on. Some hangers up close, setting out single hangers. The estimate from the guys on site was that it was going to take them four hours to set this run of pipe work out. It's actually at quite high level. So we're talking six or seven metres off the ground to the purlins. We were able to set these out within an hour and a half, utilising our new tool. And we're not even efficient at it yet. We're only just started utilising it. It is almost that simple. Something else that we've implemented with our construction technical lead is site-based models. So setting up a 55-inch screen on site in our site office and pushing live models to site every week, bi-weekly, whatever we're doing as a team. Having someone proficient in Navisworks and Revisto, utilising Revisto on site on the iPad has been, in, it, it's been, it's been groundbreaking for our company in terms of being able to coordinate on site, on the go, rather than run around and fish for PDFs. In a recent example, having this set up on site, we had a project for about 12 months where we had this PC set up. Every day I would go to site, there'd be a line out the door of other trades asking questions about the model. Where am I going next? Can I go here? Now, that's part of the coordination process that's probably let that site down, but having this facility there really benefited the entire team to understand what was happening. And progressive scanning. Paddy talked about it yesterday. It's a brilliant way to understand how we get to the accurate as installed. If we're completing LED 500s and something's changed on site and we need to go and have that accuracy within our model, then progressive scanning's a no-brainer. Very simple, quick, easy, and we bring that back in and we can update for our as-built models. Now, site-based models, obviously, I can't see PDFs leaving us any time in the next couple of years because of the way that our sites work. But having these models on site, we can take the request from our foreman. They might want a predefined view, and we can set up a predefined view of a double stack duct plant room, nice and simple, and they can model around that. They don't have to go and cut sections. It's difficult to do on site. So they send through a request and say, we might need this area predefined for us so we can review it. Something else, we're having a minor play in at the moment when we get time for it. A photo of Matt from Kennedy's there utilising <laughs> virtual reality. Our virtual reality tool, really simple. Revisto, you press one button, go straight to a virtual reality. Effectively, we're utilising it anyway. But with our headsets, um, we have had our foreman in our office reviewing projects in virtual reality to understand some sticking points. Having a 58-year-old foreman in the office who's been a plumber his entire life, put a headset on and within five minutes fly around and say, how the fuck am I going to install that, is brilliant. <laughs> it is really brilliant. Um, and then project closeout. So I look after commissioning. It's a difficult department. It's usually time-pressed. It's usually hard. And it's usually an area where you turn up to site and the ceilings are in and you're trying to find what's going on. So an old video here, as an example, we can again show the commissioning team where bits and pieces are, where our access panels are, where our valves are, understand what's above the ceiling in those areas and what problems they might encounter before they actually get to site and review bits and pieces. And as part of project closeout, we often do training with clients. We do mechanical training so they can understand where their systems are, what's happening, give them an O&M. Often I'll go to training sessions and I'll bring up the coordinated model at the end of the project. 
might be sitting in a room with 20 people, and usually the response is, wow, what's that? The client has no idea this has happened previous. Now, this is going to change, and we'll run through all of the detail of their building. And then I might give them a USB with their model on it, and they can go away and interrogate it. They much prefer it. They want to be engaged. They enjoy it. So having all of this data built in is really, like Warwick was saying, and Carl, getting rid of O&Ms. Complete waste of time in terms of hard copies. So really, it's just a, a short snapshot of how we've utilized some tech to bring us up to speed, if you like. Um, it's hard to change. It's really hard to change within an organization. I find it hard enough to change at home and get my wife to do the dinner. So <laughs> that's true. It's true. Um, so ways of, ways of making change. Utilize trials. Most software companies do free trials. Utilize those. Experience. Speak to people here. These, these are perfect forums to speak to people to understand who's utilized something before. Did it work? Didn't it work? Why not? What can we do in the future? Understand your goal. What are you trying to get to? Do you want to make your site more efficient? Are you trying to make your tendering process and de-risk it? And engagement. Engage your team on the journey and make them, let them drive the journey because your team are the people who are going to effectively get you to that end goal and often they might come up with things that you didn't think about. So what's next? Already utilizing BIM 360, but utilizing it with external contractors and bringing them up to speed so we're collaboratingly, collaboratingly live. Um, spending a bit more time in VR when we get the chance and AR as well. And potentially utilizing drones, uh, something that you might think is a mechanical contractor. Why would we want to do that? Large projects, large foot footprints, surveying existing rooftops and buildings, all helpful sort of stuff. Very cheap to do. Um, obviously, there's a few bits and pieces with compliance and understanding all of that, but that's something we're working on in the background as well. So I'll leave you with our industry is complex, it's layered, it's multifaceted with a lot of people and a lot of steps and stages. But if you can find one piece of technology or you can take away one thing from this conference that you take home, you take back to the office on Monday, you speak to people and can potentially implement that, to make your business more efficient, your projects more efficient, and your clients effectively happier at the end of the day, then we're all on the right path. Thank you.